Welcome to Disaster Proof, your nonprofit or library tech. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup Global, and I'm glad to be your host for today's event. Our expert on the line today is Lars Eric Holm. He's the lead tech, or sorry, lead community educator and IT specialist at CARD, coordinating agencies responding to disasters, a nonprofit organization based in Oakland, California, across the bridge from us here in San Francisco at TechSoup's headquarters. They were created by local community agencies after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake here in the Bay Area, and they address the emergency preparedness and disaster response needs of service providers, the organizations that are most connected to the vulnerable people in any community. So they help train organizations to better serve their communities in response to disasters and in preparedness for those. As a specialist for CARD, where he documents technical issues, creates how-to documents, creating deployment strategies for iPads and other technologies. He's helped CARD support agencies in effectively using and leveraging their technologies for everyday operations and for critical situations. So we're glad to have him joining us on the line. You'll also see assisting with chat Ali Bezdikian, who is on the back end to help answer your questions, flag them for follow-up, and just help you with any technical issues throughout the webinar. We are located here in TechSoup's San Francisco office, and as I mentioned, Lars Eric is across the bay in Oakland, California. Go ahead and chat in to let us know from where you're joining today. And while you do that, I'll go ahead and take a quick look at our agenda. We'll be covering a lot in the course of this hour. I'll start with a brief introduction to TechSoup for those of you who may not already be familiar with our work. Then we'll talk about supporting vulnerable communities, which is what CARD's work helps organizations focus on how they can best remain nimble and resilient regardless of the type of disaster that might strike, whether it's a server failure or a huge national disaster or a huge natural disaster. Uh, he'll talk about what a culture of preparedness looks like, tips on going forward, you must back up, talking about a bit uh, of mobile preparedness and things you can do to get your cell phone. Uh, as a really useful tool in your pocket wherever you go to help you respond to disasters. Power sources, how to use social channels to communicate with your constituencies, apps that you can install now, and we'll have time for additional resources in Q&A. So TechSoup Global is a nonprofit network of 63 partner NGOs providing technology resources and donations to more than 615,000 organizations in 121 countries around the world. You can see us on the map here. Everywhere there's a dot, we have a presence, and we're continuing to grow in providing services like donations of different technology, uh, applications that are being developed, local meetup groups to organizations around the world. And we also work with donor partners like Microsoft, Symantec, Cisco, and Adobe in providing technology products and grants to the tune of nearly $5 billion. You can learn more about these programs at TechSoup.org. So before we dive into having Lars Eric join us on the line with his expertise, we want to get an idea of who you are joining us today. Let us know from what role or roles are you at your organization? Maybe you're somebody on the fundraising or development team. Maybe you're a communications or marketing person. You're a leadership or board member, executive director. Are you IT staff? Are you working on the social media team? Are you program staff? Maybe you're joining us from a library today. I saw someone mention earlier they're joining from Berkeley Public Library across the bay as well. Maybe you're on the administrative team. Maybe like many smaller organizations, you wear many hats within your organization. And if there's something not included on this list, go ahead and let us know in the chat. You can always chat to us. We are reading your messages as they come in. So I'll give just a few seconds so everybody can chime in. And this helps us get an understanding of kind of where you're at and whether maybe you use more uh, or want more technical information or maybe less technical information depending on your role um, in your organization. So I'll go ahead and skip to the results. It looks like 35% almost wear many hats at their organization, not uncommon, followed by leadership, board or executive directors, and IT staff coming in a close third. So with that, that's helpful for us to get an understanding of kind of where you're at in your organization's makeup and kind of what position you may be playing in helping your organization 
uh, decide on how to be best prepared in the event of disasters or hopefully in any kind of disaster. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and have Lars Eric Holm join, join us on the line and tell us a bit about what it means to be wearing many hats uh, since that's a big chunk of our audience today and how you can best keep your organization safe and nimble regardless of what happens. Welcome to the line, Lars Eric. We're glad to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us this fine morning. Um, as you heard, my name is Lars Eric Holm. Um, just sort of to uh, uh, be a bit clear about it, my first name is actually Lars Eric. It's kind of like Joe Bob in Swedish. And um, as you can see, I work for CARD, Collaborating Agencies Responding to Disasters. And we're going to talk today about how to disaster-proof your nonprofit or library using technology. So, as you can see, I also wear many hats. You're actually looking at some of the hats I personally own. Um, and kind of the reason I'm bringing this up is because you know, often when you wear many hats for a nonprofit, some of these duties that you do become other duties assigned, are hard to prioritize. Those of you who are technically proficient probably got into that role because you made the mistake of basically being knowledgeable. You know, folks said, saw that you know something about computers, like, hey, bingo, I need you to help me with my computer here. Can you help me out? So anyway, that's kind of what we're going to be doing all about. Um, just to sort of give you a quick precursor, um, some very nice resources. If you go to our website, cardcanhelp.org, we can help. We have lots of downloadable tools and resources that we can share with you. Also, I noticed as I was getting prepared for this, I'm going to, I'm going to actually have the links to this at the end of the presentation. Um, I ran across three threads on the TechSoup forums that were actually talking about um, issues about preparedness. It was totally serendipitous. It was a really great thing to have happen. Um, I want to give you guys just a really quick little bit of background because CARD you know, collaborating agents responding to disasters. We are a little bit different than a lot of the other preparedness organizations that you may have dealt with. We actually um, take a slightly different approach, and I want to make that clear how we take that approach so that you can actually understand how we're framing things today. Um, you know, we were founded in the aftermath of the Loma Priata earthquake. Recall that happened during the Battle of the Bay, the World Series. Um, Oakland A's versus San Francisco Giants, and that brought a huge, huge amount of national attention, you know, to the Bay Area. Sports reporters suddenly ended up having to become disaster reporters, uh, and it became really clear that the needs of many nonprofits in the community they serve were not being met. So we ourselves are a nonprofit. We exist to serve nonprofits and work with community agencies in very focused areas, and our approach is different. Um, we are deliberately fear-free. A lot of our training is based on research that shows that long-term sustainable behavior, you can't scare people into preparing. So our mottos are prepare to prosper. Our mottos are to have your everyday brilliance become your disaster resilience. That kind of ties in very nicely to what Becky said earlier about being nimble and quick and able to actually respond to opportunities. Um, really fast, take a look at this if you will. Um, some of the communities that we serve, so as you can see, they're seniors, low income, visually impaired, people who are single, deaf, hard of hearing, limited English proficiency, you know, emergent needs, children, homeless, chemically dependent, um, medically compromised. You know, these are all pretty important issues. Um, take a quick look at this and see if any of the people you serve are on this list. Notice we actually have a slide, second slide. Criminals, people who might not be terribly trusting of people in authority, right? people who are physically disabled, anywhere from minor to minor, minor to major, sorry about that, people who have cognitive or developmental disabilities, folks who are away, pets and animals, know that people will make life and death decisions based on pets and animals. Cultural considerations, you know, notice we have religion highlighted there. The way that you would actually give a preparedness message to a member of good standing in the Church of Latter-day Saints, somebody who's a member of the Mormon Church, would be rather different and how you might do with some uh, flavors of Islam. You know, some areas of uh, Islam, especially in the Middle East, actually look at preparedness very differently. So here is the opportunity. I actually want to do a quick poll. Did you see on those two slides any of the people served by your organization? I'll give you a moment to respond to that. And we realize we'll be sharing tips that will help your organization prepare yourself, but we recognize that as nonprofits, as public libraries, as charities in your communities, many of you are serving 
constituents, whether it's patrons at your library or people who come in to your soup kitchen, or maybe people that you're serving in an educational capacity, or whatever it may be that you're doing. And so we wanted to get an idea of how many of you are actually also a lifeline to your communities and working with constituents directly. So I'm going to go ahead and show results here. And it looks like the great majority of you are in some capacity serving some of those people that were listed on the slides um, that Lars just showed, Lars Eric showed. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you guys. Good. So that, that, that's very useful to have. So just, just kind of be aware that and sometimes you know, a comment that once came up during one of the trainings I was doing is that everyone has special needs from time to time. Um, and we're just trying to be very explicit about it because you know, in the real world, you know, folks don't refer to themselves as access or functional needs or special needs. When people are talking about themselves, they'll usually talk about those kinds of categories. Now, when you're actually helping folks, it's really important how you frame the message. Disaster preparedness discussions can be very intimidating and threatening. And by the way, you know, I actually have a long history of working with computers. I actually remember not only when, what floppies are, but I also remember when floppies were. Actually floppy that is. I've been working with computers for a long, 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 long time. Um, and I've seen people also become intimidated by technology. Our approach is to try to explain any discussions that we have, and that's maybe a lot of today's presentation, um, about being um, positive and empowering. Basically making it so that you can respond flexibly to any kind of new opportunities, um, be ready for any kind of opportunity or challenge that comes up, um, and basically make it so that you guys can work more easily, faster, and more efficiently. So it's not actually about being ready for disasters, it's about being ready to be the best that you can be, being the most awesome that you can be. Um, and oh, by the way, these skills happen to work out well for disasters as well. That makes it much, much easier to help build a culture of preparedness, something you basically actually do every day. It's a way of being. It's the way you think and act. It just becomes part of your everyday operations. Um, just as a quick side note, I actually grew up in Alaska. Um, and when you live in a place that's remote like Alaska, um, it's just part of how you operate because you know, you're far away from the hospitals. People depend on each other. So cultural preparedness is very much a part of, of that kind of uh, growing up in that kind of an area. By the way, technology is becoming a large part of um, how we act. Technology is permeating everything. Mobile technology especially. It's really fundamentally changed things. I mean, I don't, I don't even remember what these are, but I actually remember when digital watches first came in. And when pocket calculators were a big deal and were very expensive. And now calculators are things that you stick onto your dashboard. Some of the ways that you can actually use technology to leverage and become more, more prepared, you know, build, your, build a sense of community. It's all means of communication. You can facilitate your response. You can support your partners to greatly do alerts. Oh, by the way, you can raise money. Raising money is often a great thing you can do. So being more prepared, more confident because you've got these connections with technology is a fantastic thing. And as you can see, it cuts across all kinds of demographics, small children, seniors, pretty much all cultures use technology of some kind. Now here is an interesting question. This is what I want to ask you guys. This is called the law of diffusion of innovation, which is basically a fancy way of saying, you know, when do people adopt? When do people actually embrace technology in general? And as you can see, you know, on one side of things, we actually have you know, the innovators, the people who, like me, for example, especially in my work life, often adopt technology really early on because you have to know what's going on, how things are working. And then you have your early adopters. The bulk of folks tend to wait for the early adopters to work out the kinks, and then they tend to get involved in things like, oh, yeah, those iPhones, those iPads are going to be great. They tend to be like the early majority, the late majority. Then you have people who just, for whatever reason, hold back for a long time and finally adopt stuff. You know, they finally get that uh, 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 new model of cell phone. And then you always have a small group of the people who vocally, actively resist. A nickname for those is cave dwellers. People who are consistently against virtually everything. You folks probably have some folks like that in your life. Folks are like, yeah, Facebook, that's a fad, that's going to die up soon. Twitter, never do that. So what I basically ask you guys now is if you actually have something like that, this is in another poll, where do you feel you stand? Where do you feel that you stand on this curve? So go ahead and please mark that now. And these are listed in order that they appeared on that curve, on that bell curve. So innovator is the low front end, 
early adopter, kind of rising slowly up that bell curve, early majority, late majority, right in the middle of that bell curve, kind of where the popular, uh, when, when something gets to that tipping point of adoption, and then there's the laggards and the vocal resistance. And I just commented in the chat that even sometimes a technology-focused organization like TechSoup falls into the late majority laggards, occasionally some vocal resistance, as hard as it is to admit that. And it's, it's hard to jump on the bandwagon sometimes, especially if you're not sure what it's going to look like down the road or whether it's worth your time. So go ahead and chime in. I think most people have voted, so I'll go ahead and skip to the results. Nice. And it looks like early majority, late majority, well, some early adopters too. That's great. And a few innovators in there. That's terrific. Thanks for weighing in on that. Thank you, folks. Good. And you know, in my work life, I'm often an innovator, a very early adopter. In my personal life, I actually tend to be early majority. I tend to like to wait for things to um, get the kinks out before I actually adopt it in my everyday life. So as, as, thank you very much, Becky, for, for pointing out that you know, even technology nerds sometimes hold off on things. All right, let's talk about backup. I worked for almost seven years for a software company named Dance Development. And we made some very innovative backup software called Retrospect. Retrospect was actually, uh, at its time, especially in the Macintosh area, uh, really the leader in backups. And I always liked the motto we had. Our motto was, to go forward, you must back up. It's a really, really important thing. Um, and I've actually lived with backups. I mean, I'm actually one of these people who, because I worked for, car, for dance, you know, do backups a lot just because it became part of my life. Um, and it's actually been a really important thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about backups. What makes for good backups? Um, I think there's um, some, uh, uh, like four really key things. First off, backups should be automated. They should run frequently, I think daily at the very least, without requiring human intervention, a minimum of that. So you know, perhaps you might actually have to hook up some devices or swap some media that physically needs to be done. But other than that, you don't want this to be something that somebody has to remember to launch. Um, the, and that actually leads to the next point, though, which, which is monitor. You want to make sure somebody's regularly inspecting the backup logs, documenting media rotation, et cetera. So there's a certain amount of tension between these first two aspects, automated and monitored, but it can be tempting to let the backups run and forget about it. So you want to make it really easy to monitor. With everybody wearing all these hats, you want to basically have real simple backup logs where people can just like maybe check off a box or stamp in a date that says, yes, I rotated the media, I swapped the hard drives, what have you. Other really important aspect of backups is they should be redundant and rotated. You should have multiple copies. You should have multiple types. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and you should actually rotate these in different locations among different devices. So those two actually go together. They match really well, just like peanut butter and chocolate. Now, what do I mean by types of backups? I like to call this the holy trinity of backups. Three different types of backups. And I, I think it's really important for an agency to actually have all three kinds whenever possible. First type is versioned backups. This is a little bit like a time machine. In fact, if those of you that use Apple products might be aware that Apple's built-in backups in is in fact called time machine. Um, and this basically gives you copies of your files as they appeared at many points in time. Bootable backups, that's the exact copy of your startup disk. And off-site backups, extra backups stored far or far away from your regular backups and from the regular location. Let's talk a little bit about each of these. And by the way, I get to the point. I don't know how many guys, you know, there have a lot of librarians in, in the audience. You know, uh, a really nice um, quote that I remembered when I was talking about the Holy Trinity. There is a book called uh, by Arthur C. Clarke called Rendezvous with Rama. And he always noted that the Ramans do everything in threes. It's kind of an engineering concept, actually. Uh, triple redundancy. Okay, version backups, your time machine. So what's good about this is that it actually allows you to protect yourself against file corruption that you didn't know about or user errors. Or if you're writing the great American novel, allowing you to go back to an earlier version of a chapter because you decided that your current revisions, yeah, I don't like that. I like the stuff I had earlier. Um, nowadays, this is, I've seen backups back change a lot. Nowadays, external hard drives are so inexpensive, it's really a good idea just to have a large external hard drive. Um, so it's pretty easy to get a hard drive that's at least one and a half times to twice as big as the hard drive that you're doing most of your work on. And that allows you to store a nice session of a, a nice, nice time range of versions. You should be doing your version backups at the very minimum or once a day. 
and frankly, I think it's better to do it much more often. You know, so when I have my backup drive hooked up to my computer when I'm here at home, and it backs up hourly. That can be a really, really handy thing, especially when working with stuff that's constantly changing, like a PowerPoint that you're trying to draft. Let's go ahead and talk about bootable duplicates. This is also sometimes called a clone. And what's good about bootable duplicates is it allows you to get back to work right away. So if you're in a situation where you have multiple machines, you probably want to have bootable duplicates of your most critical machines. You know, so your, your executive director, your primary server, things like that. So the version backups, if you decide to have to do a full restore from a version backup, that can actually take quite some time before you're back up and running. With a clone, you could actually theoretically take that hard drive to a completely different machine, boot up off that, and bingo, you're going. Uh, bootable duplicates you know, should be at the very minimum of once a week. I think daily is even better, but at least once a week. Because then what you could do is come off your bootable duplicates, and then anything that changed the last few days, you could get off your version backup. It's also a thing that you want to update right before you do any kind of major software upgrades. That way, if things go wrong, sometimes they do, um, then you actually are able to roll back to how you were before that, that upgrade actually messed everything up for you. Um, duplicates should be on their own drives or partitions. Partitions are when you take a physical drive and divide them into their different little areas. It's kind of like having different rooms. And last but not least is your off-site storage. This can be really important because it's entirely possible things could happen in a regional fashion. Um, it protects from all sorts of like, like low virus, floods, quakes, you know, um, civil unrest, zombie attacks, that kind of thing. For most folks and for a lot of the agencies that card serves, um, we have a lot of folks that do cloud packages sometimes. Like we actually have one um, food service provider, a, uh, uh, they're called Open Heart Kitchen, and they actually don't even have a permanent office. They actually work, they actually function using laptops at whatever location they happen to be at. And interestingly enough, that actually makes them incredibly resilient. They actually are constantly keeping stuff in the cloud and are able to function quite well. They also have redundant backups made locally, so if they don't have an service, it can actually function. Now, if for some reason cloud services don't work for you, then the alternative is to rotate two or preferably three hard drives weekly to different locations. If you do that, then you want to keep them away from extreme heat or cold in a secure location. So you probably shouldn't be storing these things, working on hard drives in the trunk of your car or in your garage. And by the way, it's a good idea if you're doing a, a, a hard drive approach to consider encrypting them unless you're in a really safe place like a safety bottom box. All really good <laughs> advice. And, and I love to just chime in because uh, I feel like people learn the hard lesson of backing up once they've actually had a catastrophic uh, backup related tragedy. And uh, at, at the organization I worked for, one of them, I won't name names previously, we had um, a single server kept in a broom closet essentially, and didn't realize that it was located directly below a sprinkler for the building's fire hazard system. And uh, we regularly had fire alarms go off due to people overcooking their popcorn in the microwave. <laughs> and one day the sprinklers actually went off, destroyed our single server, and the little disks that we were swapping out had not been backing up, and we just didn't realize it because we just weren't checking to make sure that they were successfully backing up. And we lost everything. We had to go back through Outlook, through email, through papers and scan things in to try and recoup all of the documents and our financial data and all of our grant proposals, tons and tons of information that was just lost. And we had no cloud, um, cloud-based backup at that time either. And so our rule became two by two by two two different types of backup with at least two different staff people having access in two different locations. So maybe one on-premise, one off-site or in the cloud. And that became our rule moving forward. So we learned a really hard lesson that day, but uh, never again did we not have at least two by two by two. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Becky. That's it's really good. In fact, I'm actually looking right now at the end of this presentation, I have a bibliography. And I'm looking at the page right now. It's a quote from the book. It says, there are two classes of people, those who have lost data and those who are going to lose data. So, and that sounds, I'm not trying to be scary about it. It's just, you know, hard drives and, and media, they just don't last, you know. So, um, what was I going to say here? So, um, actually, it's funny you say that story too because this same book, he actually gives some examples of things that can go wrong. And probably the most interesting one was Cuban cigars. 
I guess some, a few of the old boys were having a really a bit of a celebration, lit up a bunch of really smelly Cuban cigars, which set off the sprinkler system, which then, of course, you know, did damage to their computers. So, so cool beans. Um, nice other aspect of backups, and this is actually really good ties into what Vicky just said, is you actually want to verify that your backups are actually working. So this is kind of a whimsical thing. Every Friday the 13th, and remember that 13 in some cultures is a highly auspicious number. It's actually a lucky number, not a negative number. Do, do international verify your backups day. Actually try restoring a couple of files to confirm your backups are working. Try doing a test boot from your bootable duplicate. Make sure you actually can boot off of it, off of your own computer or a different computer. It's just really good to actually make sure that things actually work. Now at the end of the presentation, you know, I'm going to actually list a couple of resources, a couple of uh, suggested pieces of software and such. But it's really hard to actually be absolute because there are a lot of really good products out there. That kind of depends on your platform. You know, I'm certainly willing to be available to answer any more detailed questions later on. Um, I want to take a fast pause here now. This actually can be a big topic for a lot of people. So, you know, does anybody have any kind of questions? We do have a couple of questions that have come in. James asked, would image backups using Acronis count as a bootable backup? That's one of his questions. I believe so. I believe so. Um, we actually want to check on that. And this actually brings up a really important point that I actually said that uh, you know, bootable backups, you, know, you, you have to use specialized software for that. It takes um, specialized software to make a backup bootable. Um, no matter whether, whether the software claims to make bootable backups or not, I really do feel you should physically test it. So use, did you say it was Kronos? Yeah, I think I said it was Kronos. So you know, actually, yeah. actually, try, actually try taking the uh, image that you have and using that to actually boot off of. The most important thing is that you get back up and running right away. You want to be able to get back up and running as quickly as possible. So Great. Any and he, he also asked you know, and mentioned that the sprinkler issue is what they're facing right now. So we know we're, uh -huh. we were not alone in that scenario with having a sprinkler directly above our server without actually having ever realized that could be problematic. He said, I want to make sure that we have viable backups of our server, but what other methods can be done? Would a server encasement help? And I found that even here in our offices at TechSoup, we have a whole big server room, and it overheats, and we've got to you know, have equipment set up to kind of help surround those with cooling uh, mechanisms and, and to keep them from too much humidity, too much moisture. So I think an encasement could help. Do you have any advice on that, Lars Eric? So, you know, and definitely talk to the manufacturers of your equipment and such, you know, but, you know, like server racks that keep things off of the floor. In fact, I worked for Holy Names University, and we had a small microvax. And oddly enough, when they brought the server into the room where it was kept, they didn't bother to take it off of the packing pallet, the pallet underneath. And you know, we figured that's okay. There's airflow underneath it. it. Turned out to be a great thing actually, because uh, about a half year later, there was a flood that caused water to happen on the floor, and that packing pallet keeping the server off the floor really, really, really helped. So yeah, absolutely, the server encasements, you know, things that actually keep the water off of the equipment itself. You know, it, um, it's also a good idea, your servers are usually connected to some kind of a uninterruptible power supply, usually called the UPS for short. You want to make sure that that is actually protected as well, um, because yet another thing that causes damage to things sometimes are uh, power failures, you know, or brownouts. In fact, brownouts are really nasty. Brownouts are actually worse than actual power failure because of the power surges. So it's really good to make sure that your uninterruptible power supply actually also does what's called line conditioning. Now it's kind of like you see when you have a um, on your uh, power strips often protect you against surges. So that can actually be a really good a good thing. Um, does that help? Cool. Were there any other questions about backups? You know, I'll be available to answer more things at the end as well. But. Great. I think we can go ahead and move forward, but keep those questions yes. coming in. Anyone who has them, we will have more time at the end for some more questions. Keep those questions coming. Absolutely. Okay, here's another aspect of things. And if you go to CARD's website and go to our Tools and Resources section, you'll actually see that we have a whole section of tools that you can download and print at will. We call them potty posters. It's part of our potty poster initiative. What I'm showing you here is our potty poster about how to program your cell phone. And by the way, the idea behind potty posters is you can basically print these out and hang them up in the restrooms. Because we found out that people will read stuff that's in restrooms. People will read it. So if they're going to read stuff that's in a restroom, might as well make it something that is actually, um, um, actually educational. And by the way, it doesn't have to be in the restroom. It can be in the lunchroom. I know in some universities, they actually have these in the hallways outside the classrooms. It's a great tool to download. 
if you guys did nothing else, I'm going to actually pause and look at this list. If you guys actually have your cell phone available, um, if you actually could actually grab that right now or just take a note right now, pick one of these things to do on your cell phone right now. Make your cell phone an awesome preparedness tool. The top one right there, um, some of you folks may have heard about this, but call, it's called ICE Your Phone. ICE stands for In Case of Emergency. And what that's about is basically programming in your phone, in the contact somewhere, having the word, having the, the, the letters ICE, I-C-E. Um, the motivation for that initially is that a first responder, if he found me unconscious, if he or she found me unconscious on the ground with my phone in my pocket, they could pull my phone out, scroll down the list looking for ICE, and actually see who my emergency contacts are. I personally have things like ICE dash wife dash Martha, ICE dash daughter dash Monica, or daughter dash Megan. So it's actually several ICEs. Even if your phone is locked, there are actually ways you can often still access this information. It also just makes it much easier on your brain, however, like in a case of emergency, to actually go to your phone and actually look for ICE and quickly pull those contacts up. Um, one of the agencies I did a training for is Girls Inc. in downtown Oakland. And their emergency contact list for their entire agency is actually programmed into all their staff cell phones as ICE number one, ICE number two. It's their phone tree. Their emergency response phone tree is programmed by their staff and their cell phones. Making sure you've got I have this in my phone. As Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Becky. Go ahead, Becky. I was just going to comment that I have this in my phone um, and learned this from you guys a few years ago. Um, and I have one that's ice out of area that goes to my mom in Michigan. So if you're in an area where you have uh, natural disasters that happen in your region where emergency responders may need to reach somebody who's not in the region, um, it's great to have a person who's not in the area. So I've got my mom in Michigan programmed as Ice Patricia Weekend. So you can use it in a variety of ways to help preparedness and responders uh, really know who to contact if they come across you and need to get in touch with somebody in your family. Yeah, it's an awesome, awesome thing. Um, actually, you know, it's also great. I have, with a name like Lars Eric, it probably won't surprise anyone to know that I actually have family in Sweden. Um, so international phone numbers can be an especially good thing to have programmed properly in your cell phone because under stress, it can be really hard to dial those. So, awesome. Yeah, and your phone, you know, what happens if your phone doesn't have reception? We'll actually be talking a little bit more about that later as well, but actually your phone can be a fantastic preparedness tool just by having information in it. So even if you can't make calls on your phone, even if your phone's not connected in any way, it's actually still a little in-your-pocket resource for things like your medications and medical conditions, you know, daycare providers, you know, pictures of yourself, copies of your important documents, and there's various apps we're going to talk about later. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll actually see an example of something we like to call a tear sheet. It's really easy to print these up. We usually print them up a third of a page. Um, you can do your local print shop and do these pretty cheaply for you on little pads, and it's something you can actually pass out. So this is an example uh, for Oakland, some phone numbers that are Oakland-specific, you know, Bay Area Rapid Transit, our safety and ambassadors. Some of the numbers here, though, like U.S. Poison Control, that's national. So you can actually make an example for yourself of numbers, and it's perfectly great to keep in your wallet or purse or stick on your refrigerator. Phone trick number two, um, and it's very easy to look this up, but if one of you folks told me your cell phone number and you also told me your provider, AT&T versus Verizon versus Sprint, for example, it turns out that almost all of these have a phone number, it's possible basically to craft an email address that will go email to text. So if I dropped my phone in a bucket of water and destroyed it, but I had access to a computer, I could still send text to you folks by using these special email addresses. From your end, it looks like I texted you. From my end, it looks like an email. So very easy to look up. As a matter of fact, the way it's all set up was actually, you'll see there's a little e-how exactly about how to text a cell phone from your computer. It's a really handy trick. I'm actually going to go back and go back a slide because you can actually very easily make groups where you could then, with one email address, text your entire staff. There's other apps for doing that as well. But it's just a really handy trick. It's a handy thing to know. All right, next consideration. We're talking about technology. In disasters, you might not have power. You might not have electricity. How can you get around that? 
there are gazillions and gazillions of options for this. Um, there's actually a whole plethora of products. Um, and by the way, I noticed that a lot of these products have very unique and even quixotic names. Um, I actually just grabbed a really re very recent article done just a couple of months ago that looks at 30 of the juiciest portable battery chargers money can buy. And they go by names like Ingress and Oxo and Mtech and Centaur and really cool names like that. So very easy to find this, or find this out. It's actually a whole series of little batteries and things that you can have available. Um, Morphy case. Our executive director, Adam Ray Jones, actually has a case where you can actually flip the switch and she's got more power. Car adapters. And by the way, a really good habit to get into is to actually, um, is to actually uh, have your phone plugged in whenever you're driving around. Um, another habit is to give your, your friends car chargers. Anna Marie Jones, our executive director, likes to give her friends car chargers because that way she knows that if she's in their car, she can charge her own phone with it. Um, and car chargers are often very adaptable. A super, super cool present that you can give people, I'm actually showing you a photograph here of two of my own, are these little pocket keychain batteries that fit in your pocket and give you a single charger off your phone. They're very inexpensive. The red one actually costs like about $15. Um, the one on the right actually was a present for my wife for Christmas. And I don't know how many of you guys are campers, but it's kind of funny because campers actually, uh, you think that camping, I don't know, the idea of taking technology out and camping, I kind of trying to get away from technology, frankly. But you know, um, it's actually kind of, a, a, kind of a cool thing to be able to actually uh, uh, charge stuff off of solar chargers. And they've really dropped in price. A lot of the things here are under $200, some cases under $100. That can actually be a really quick option if you can have. All right, social media. Social media is a way that you can actually stay connected. And a really important point to note is a lot of these platforms here actually have funding and infrastructures that um, governments, agencies could only dream of. You know, Facebook actually has server farms located in northern Sweden on the other side of the world. They're really committed to getting things back up and running quickly. Facebook is marvelous for having you and your partnerships ahead of time and being engaged with government agencies and officials. It's also a communication tool that, frankly, a lot of people are already familiar with. A lot of people, you know, even if they're not avid Facebookers, you have a Facebook account just so you can already follow stuff. I already actually know some agencies that actually have a Facebook page set up specifically for emergencies. Um, in addition to working for CARD, I also teach the Tillman's class at the Aikido Institute here in Oakland. And I have a colleague who went to Japan a few years back to practice Aikido, the traditional Japanese martial art, and also study Japanese and travel. Shortly after Curtis got there, they had an earthquake, followed by a tsunami, followed by a reactor meltdown. And we were all kind of freaking out, wondering what on earth was happening before Curtis. We discovered that Curtis was okay by his Facebook page. He posted a message and said, hi, we're okay. Um, we're going to leave Japan soon, so not to be a brain. Just that being able to say that you're okay is a fantastic thing. Another way you could actually do this would be, be, be via LinkedIn. LinkedIn is actually the, the social media that people use that don't actually like social media. And this can actually be a fantastic way to build up a network of connections with partners and agencies. Um, you can do status updates, very Twitter-like. Um, and it actually links very nicely with other applications. So your Twitter feed can actually post to your LinkedIn. You can say things like, I'm okay, and all of your professional colleagues located here, and notice that nearly half the members are outside the U.S. So it actually has a really good international scope, just like TechSoup does. Twitter. Twitter is the rushing media river of media social media. I'm not going to actually talk to this, but when you look at the slides later, this kind of describes how Twitter works. Um, I well, do want to apologize. The statistics at the bottom here are actually dated. Um, the last time we checked, the service actually does 1.6 billion that's B as in billion, queries per day. And as of May of this year, 2015, Twitter has more than 500 million active users. So this stat, stat is actually really dated. My mistake for that. Uh, my apologies for that mistake. Um, Twitter is actually a really, really great way to stay connected. It was actually instrumental in a whole series of disasters. You know, H1N1, the Center for Disease Control, did a lot of um, control over rumor control by, by, staying, by monitoring that. So I actually personally found out that things like BART, I actually find out why BART will stop in the tunnel before they say anything over the PA system. So whether you, whether you ever tweet or not, it's a great way to basically stay connected, keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening. 
This is actually a nice example, in fact, when a card was actually at the emergency response center for Occupy Open. Twitter let us know what was going on. Okay, this is going to be really, really fast. Pair this X. And rather than giving you guys a boring list, we actually have like a whole series of slides that we go through. But here are some nicely recommended apps. I'm going to spend a few seconds talking about each of these apps, um, and then I'll be available, we'll be available for questions later on about them. GroupMe. GroupMe is a fantastic way to get messages out to large groups of people. Dropbox. The guy who founded Dropbox kept losing his USB drives. He got tired of that and founded Dropbox. Dropbox integrates really, really well with many other apps. So it's a great way to keep your stuff in the cloud. One password. Um, we, I could actually talk at length. This could be a topic all into itself about how to keep your password information safe and secure. Fortunately, and Becky can chime in on this real quickly, there's going to be a webinar on cyber security, security sometime this October. So it's quite soon. I highly recommend checking that out. Yes, we will be There's having data. one October 1st, so watch out for that coming soon. October 1st, coming soon to a computer near you. So remember, if your cell phone isn't, doesn't actually have any um, uh, reception or connection, you can still have all these apps that will give you information on first aid and CPR and being able to locate where, locate where things are. If you do have a connection, you can do a police scanner and actually monitor what the first responders are up to. You can make recordings. You can capture things that people are saying. Um, or you can actually record something and play it back over and over again to save your voice. There's something called the incident command system. It's used by responders. It's actually a great way also to form a team, Johnny on the spot. Um, and you can actually have an ICS reminder on how to do things, on how ICS works, all the different aspects of it. Being able to actually scroll a message over and over again can be an awesome thing. Remember your CPR? Maybe not. Maybe it's good to have an app remind you of that, especially when you're freaking out. Triage. Actually knowing, you, knowing how to um, actually do medications properly. There's a cool app called Megaphone that amplifies your voice. Social media is a great way to stay connected for emergencies, but there's also a specialized app called Mixel. Mixel is actually a way that you can actually connect to what your responders are doing, gives you alerts for your areas, and so on. Um, I actually noticed that when I traveled out of state, Mixel automatically started giving me messages for my new location out of California. I thought that was a pretty nifty thing. Skype, remember Skype, you don't have to have video. Skype can also just be audio. It's an alternate way to handle things if your landlines are down or your cell phone isn't working. And tied into that as well is there's an app called Line2. There's other apps that allow your iPad or your iPhone or your smartphone to be able to act as a telephone into itself. Here in the Bay Area, we have a transit, public transit information provider called 511. So wherever you guys are located, I think there's a really good chance that you have a similar app. Weather. It's always good to know what the weather will be and whether there will be weather. Some areas of the country that's more important than others. Siren Machine. One of my favorite clips from a TV show called The Big Bang Theory has Sheldon waking up one of his roommates with the alarm that's on his phone. A lot of you folks are probably familiar with um, Google Translate, uh, which is a handy thing. Jubigo is good to know about simply because it does not require an internet connection to work. So if you don't have connectivity, this could be a great way to go. News aggregators like Flipboard actually can keep you abreast of things that are happening. In fact, I know Flipboard, whenever there's a major incident or major anniversary, often has a specialized section. So that was pretty quick, but that's actually because it's more, less, less boring than giving you just a single list. It's really easy to do any of these things. So the thing that you want to ask yourselves now is what is one of the things that you guys are going to do? What you're going to do? Are you going to program your cell phone? Are you going to download an app? I would like each of you guys to please um, commit to taking on to one of these things before the end of your day is done. It's not hard to do. It's fast, fun, and easy, and it actually just increases your preparedness to, to no end. Thank you very much to all of our supporters. Um, this is an indication of some of the people who have funded this in the past. Um, here is a little bit of resources I promised you guys. So tools and resources. You can look at our research and download our potty posters. Um, we actually helped with TechSoup create a document called the Resilient Organization, a guide for disaster planning and recovery. I love this document. Um, we were part of the collaboration that made that, and at this URL is that document and some other resources, things you can download. These are the three articles I mentioned earlier. An inside view of how you can harness technology to support disaster relief. That's a really interesting read in TechSoup forums. 
five ways libraries support disaster relief. Um, our executive director, Anna Marie Jones, actually in the first 10 years of her professional life, worked for a library. Um, I have fond, fond memories of libraries. We love libraries and librarians. Libraries are awesome, and libraries actually, you may not realize it, but they can actually be a huge support for this. There was a poll that was done on the single most important thing you can do to prepare for disasters. So check out those articles, they're really handy. Um, here are some links about solar panels. You know, REI and uh, Little Radiant that was done fairly recently. Retrospect is the software product I used to work for back when Dance existed, and it now is owned by a company that calls themselves Retrospect Inc. It's a little bit high end, but it's kind of worth knowing that this is actually a software that companies like Pixar use. So it's, and it was also the first product capable of backing up over a network. So if you're backing up a number of machines, Retrospect can be a good way to go. By the way, quick side note, check this out. Pixar actually has a little video talking about how they saved their own bacon when they actually deleted a huge series of files for one of their upcoming movies, and they were able to restore that information from a backup one of the employees was keeping. Another piece of software, which is also both Windows and Mac OS X, is called Data Backup 3 from so ProSoft Engineering. That's good for people who are on a tighter budget, and it's also geared more towards like individual users. And then here's a repeat of the um, battery charges you guys could buy. Um, take control of backing up your Mac. Even if you don't use Macs, I really think that's actually still a really good way to go. It's really easy to generalize as advice. That's actually one of the first places I got the idea of the whole Trinity backups. Uh, the book down here, Complete Guide to Backup Management, is actually probably out of print. You can go to the link here. That's actually the book that had the story about the Cuban cigars and, and so on. And a lot of the knowledge I gained in the early on is encapsulating this book. I'd like to thank you guys very much. Please go to this slide and feel free to connect to me to ask me any questions you guys might have. Or you can also connect to um, um, our executive director, Anna Marie Jones. Um, we're actually suffering from a bit of a cash crush crisis at this moment because our government funding is actually not coming as quickly as it ought to. Please, if you found anything I talked about today in any way useful, or if the idea of fear-free preparedness really appeals to you, uh, please check our GoFundMe account, and please check out the Oakland Post article, um, and do everything you can to support farm. Thank you all very much. I think I kept that pretty close. It's a little long, but um, I'm going to hand the things back over to Becky. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that, Lars, Eric. And you know, you shared that tidbit about Pixar, and I think it was uh, Toy Story 2 that almost didn't exist because they lost yeah. like 80% of it uh, when their servers all died. And they had somebody who was actually teleworking, telecommuting, who had mm -hmm. saved a copy of it at home, and uh, mm -hmm. they were able to retrieve it from that. So her remote work actually saved that in like two or three years worth of, of work that they'd done on that movie already because they were able to restore it from her work, which is just crazy for, uh, to think about a company as big and prominent as Pixar potentially losing everything. Yeah. Before we get into yeah. uh, other Q&A, I just wanted to mention uh, some additional resources here through TechSoup. Uh, one of them is an app that we've been working on through our, our division called Caravan Studios. It's one of our projects here at TechSoup. And they are working on a whole series of different apps that they have created with community input uh, from the communities that are directly needing and, and requesting technologies to help them meet some of the needs of their communities that are being served. So this is one of them called Four Bells, and it's currently in a pilot program. They're testing it out. But it's essentially to be able to deploy volunteers with specific tasks like we need somebody to come and deliver food. We need somebody to help set up beds in, a, in an emergency shelter. And your volunteers from your community can say, yes, I'll come and do that, or yes, I'll help with deploying information online, or yes, I'll help with your communication, or whatever it may be. It helps you get your, your supporters who already care about the work that you do deployed quickly and in a voluntary capacity during a disaster. So it helps you connect those volunteers to the tasks that need to be done during any emergency. You can check out more at fourbells.org or also at caravanstudios.org. And they are creating a whole bunch of really interesting social good apps like Four Bells, uh, including one that's you know, to help people find 
lunches during the summer for youth who are looking for summer lunches that uh, qualify during the school year but may not know where to find a good meal. That one's called Range. And they also have another one called Safe Night that's uh, to help people fund beds for domestic violence shelters that have run out of space or people who are uh, experiencing trafficking and need a safe shelter to sleep in, your supporters can reach out and help fund a bed for them for the night in a place where they may be out of shelter beds. So they're doing some really great work at Caravan Studios, so we're always excited to talk about what they're doing. And you can find some of these apps available for Windows phones, Google Play, and in the Apple iTunes App Store. Additionally, we've got um, a bunch of different backup resources. So for those of you who are looking for backup tools, we have partnerships with companies like Symantec. So if you need backup exec, or you need system recovery backup programs, or you want to have a cloud-based backup service, these types of things are available. You can search backup on TechSoup.org to find a whole bunch of different options. You can also find things like Box, which donates access to their cloud-based file sharing content management systems. So if you want to have some redundancy, maybe you have an in-house server and you're looking at going to the cloud, this might be a good option for you. Um, and also Microsoft has things like SharePoint and OneDrive. So you can access any of those kind of things as well. For those of you who are uh, in libraries or running public computing centers, we also have uh, Drive Vaccine. I wanted to mention that quickly because this is a, a rollback system similar to Steady State or Deep Freeze. So this is available depending on how many licenses you need in different batches for folks who are running public libraries. But there's a lot on our site that you can find. Uh, if you just search backup, you search disaster planning, you'll find all kinds of resources and content, blog posts, stories from libraries and nonprofits that have helped serve their communities through disasters and the tips and things that have worked for them. So feel free to check it out, see what else is in, in uh, our site resources that might be useful for you. You can also continue the discussion in our Tech Planning and Policies Forum. So if there are questions you have today that didn't get answered or things you want to learn more about, you can always go to our forums and engage in conversation there as well. So I'd love to go ahead and have a couple of minutes before we wrap up for other questions. If you have questions, go ahead and ask them in the chat. Mary Beth just chimed in to ask whether you'd get access to the slide presentation via the email. You will. You'll get the full PowerPoint. You'll get the full recording of today's webinar. And we'll include a bunch of links that we'll call out in the body of that email so you can just click right through to those. Um, so question for you, Lars Eric. When prioritizing the different things that you can do, since there are so many different ways that you can help better prepare yourself. I mean, I really love the, the low-key simple things like programming my cell phone to have ice. I think that's great. Things like setting up backup systems for my organization are a little bit daunting for me as somebody who's not an IT person. But where would you recommend people start uh, in, as far as top priorities for helping ensure their organizations are you know, doing at least the bare minimum? What's the best place to, to begin? Well, uh, first off, I think program the cell phone is, is easily one of the easiest things you can do. And it just becomes a habit as well. I mean, just, just getting into the habits, like always capturing um, cell phone numbers. You know, I actually, both I and Anna Marie are in the habit of just like doing a fast save of any kind of calls we receive. And a really great fast story is that a colleague, a coworker, who had, her phone had died, and couldn't call her daughter. Anna Marie was able to call her daughter on her behalf because she had called Anna Marie once and she'd saved the number. And you know, nowadays, you know, having tons and tons of numbers in your phone isn't necessarily a hard thing. And so grabbing a couple of apps for your cell phone and just getting building up certain habits about, you know, um, having numbers pre-programmed in your cell phone is a fantastic way to go. And that's that's just so easy to do. And it's so empowering. It's it's probably the biggest return for the least effort you can get. Um, I'm probably biased because of my background. I mean, I worked for a company that made backup software for like seven years. So, um, you know, I think really, I mean, having backups, you know, having backups of your of, of your information is just like so super uber important. You know, personally speaking, for the Oakland Hills fire, we were on um, kind of below Highway 13 uh, on Park Boulevard here in Oakland, which wasn't too far away from the fire. It wasn't too close, but we thought we might have to leave. And the first two things that went in the trunk of our car were the diapers and the photo albums. 
you know, getting the, saving those photos. I mean, nowadays, a lot of people are less worried about their photos because their photos are shared in the cloud and so on. You know, so I've always kind of felt an appreciation for the importance of backing things up. And while it sounds kind of daunting, you know, the, 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 the range of products that are available, not just the products you showed, but, you know, some of the products that are referred to, it's actually not so hard. It's actually not so hard. Um, hard drives have become so expensive. The backup hardware is a lot cheaper than it ever was. I think backups are a really important thing, getting some kind of a backup, even if it's just, you know, doing a duplicate to an external hard drive. I certainly agree with that, having learned the hard way um, yeah. <laughs> myself in the past. And you know, and I would agree that it doesn't have to be that difficult, especially these days where more and more installed software producers and creators are also creating mm -hmm. cloud-based versions or cloud-based access to a lot of their resources. Now if you serve mm -hmm. uh, certain communities where you have sensitive health data and you're restricted from being able to keep some of that online, that's understandable, but there probably are a lot of things you can keep safely online um, and that you, you know, you're doing the checks and talking to those different providers to make sure that their security and encryption and all of that is sound in your agreement right. before you move to them. But most of them, especially if you're a smaller organization, having just a server in your storeroom or your, your broom closet like in my prior organization um, is often going to leave you much more vulnerable than having something hosted in the cloud where it's you know, part of Microsoft's or Google's or one of these big huge companies, Amazon Web Services, whatever it may be, uh, where they've got tens of thousands of servers in these huge server farms in a huge variety of locations around the world that are redundantly backing up with lots of redundant yep. power sources. And you know, even though the risks of breach are there for sure, I mean there's risk of breach in any situation, they're probably uh, much less likely to really lose your data uh, completely than you are with something happening like the sprinkler destroying your server in the broom closet. Yeah. So, and just to address advice. your last point, and just to address your last point about security, like maybe you can't store stuff in the cloud for security reasons, or you have to check into that. Most good backup products, especially the mid-range to higher end, have encryption as an option, and the encryption is actually quite strong. Um, and there's also separate encryption products. So you can actually encrypt stuff before you pop it on. So. Right, yeah. One of our uh, folks who does a lot on security talks about a program called TrueCrypt that they really love. So if they have specific documents or data that's you know, mission critical, but it's got sensitive data, they use TrueCrypt to add an extra layer of encryption, and it's free. So yeah. I'd love to go ahead and wrap us up since we are at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, Lars Eric. Thank you to our audience for chiming in. And please continue to let us know in the chat what one thing you learned today that you're going to go back and try and implement, or maybe you already did something during this call. Maybe you programmed something into your phone, or maybe you're going to create that cheat sheet with the local emergency numbers that will not only help you and your staff respond better, but also help your communities that you serve since 76 or 80 percent of you said you serve some of those vulnerable communities. And go ahead and keep in mind that you can share all of this information with your friends and colleagues so that they can also benefit from having some tips on helping better secure and, and uh, keep their organizations nimble and resilient in response to any disaster. I'd like to invite you to join us for upcoming events and webinars. Next week we have two different events, one for libraries in particular, or those of you who may have uh, public computer labs if you're a nonprofit. Um, we'll be talking about managing mobile devices and how you can check those devices out and make that easier for you. Then we'll be talking next Thursday with the CEO of GrantStation about how to make your grant requests sparkle. This is an event that is normally charged $89, and it is free for TechSoup participants next week. And it will not actually be archived on our website. So you need to join us live to get the best out of that one if you're looking at grant proposal writing. And then we'll be talking about how to navigate the world of donated and discounted technology on September 24th. We'll be joined by folks from the independent sector and Good360 as well as TechSoup to talk about all of the different ways you can access donations and discounts on your technology. So join us for those and keep an eye out for more coming in October. Like I mentioned, we'll be doing one on cybersecurity on October 1st and many more after that. So keep joining us in the months and weeks ahead. You can find us on TechSoup Global at TechSoup.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. So we hope you'll join us there. Lastly, thank you to ReadyTalk who provides the use of this platform for us to present these webinars to you on a weekly basis. 
We hope when you close out that you will complete the post-event survey so we can continue to improve our webinar programming. Thank you all so much and have a terrific afternoon. Bye-bye.